David Ash. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here with you today. You're the author of a couple of books, uh, The New Physics of Consciousness and uh, a biography of your very interesting, it sounds, father, late father. Um, and you have been uh, looking at this, the kind of science of consciousness and of life for some time since you were in your teens. Um, just like to know a little bit about how that all started. Well, it goes back a lot further than my teens. I started, I declared what I was going to do at the age of four. Apparently, uh, one of my father's patients asked me what I was going to do uh, when I grow up, and I said, I'm going to prove the existence of God through science. Wow, and that was at what age? Four. And then at six, I was introduced to nuclear physics. And when I was a six-year-old, I went out with my father and my brothers and sisters in an old Rolls-Royce prospecting for uranium on uh, Bodmin Moor. <laughs> and my, what my father did is he combined uh, the paranormal, combined dowsing with modern physics. So yeah. the way we homed in on the loads of uranium is that my brother Tim would sit in the front of the Rolls-Royce with a, a little lump of uranium oxide in, in his hand and he would scan the horizon with the other hand and until he felt a tingling mm. and then we'd follow that tingling and at each junction my father would st stop the roller and, 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 and Tim would scan the horizon again and eventually we found ourselves on, on, on the edge of Bodmin Moor, a place called Bray Down mm. and Tim began to cry because the tingling had turned to a painful prickle oh, no. and uh, so my father stopped the car and, and rolled the roller onto the roadside, he scanned underneath the Rolls Royce with a Geiger counter. So the Geiger counter will actually detect the radioactivity at short range, mm. but not from 20 miles or so away. Mm. And so he scanned underneath the Rolls Royce, because that's where Tim started to cry. And that's where the Geiger counter indicated the radioactivity. Mm. And so he rolled the roller into the roadside, and we got out the picks and shovels, and we were like, Dr. Ash and the Seven Dwarfs. It really was like yeah. that. It sounds wonderful. He sounds like quite an inspiration, your dad. Oh, he was amazing. He, int he introduced me to Einstein and Rutherford as a child. So I was a uh, six-year-old scientist. Okay. And we dug this great lump of uranium out of, out of the road by the end of the day, leaving a, like a bomb crater in the road. And Pa had smashed it up with a sledgehammer. And we, we, we picked out these little bits of black bits, and they were the 10% ura uranium oxide. And I mean, we had dustbin loads of uranium oxide outside the back door in Poffel and Butte. I mean, we had enough uranium to make our own bomb. <laughs> <laughs> so how did this get you thinking about the science of life? Well, because of my early introduction to physics, I, I was introduced to the work of Einstein. Mm. My father's icon in physics was Lord Rutherford, but mine was Albert Einstein. Okay. And <clears throat> so at the age of 16, when I was introduced to some books on um, on yogic philosophy, I mean that's a story in itself. I mm. I was on the beach. I was a teenager, a 16-year-old, and I was on the beach and I fancied a girl. Though she was, a, you know, so I <laughs> I sort of rippled a few muscles and <laughs> moved across, and um, you know I started sort of chatting to her, and she looked at me and I thought she was admiring, and she was looking me up and down, and she said, "You know what?" She said, "You remind me of an Oxfam advert." <laughs> How humiliating. Oh, terribly humiliating. So anyway, I was concerned to put on a bit of muscle and I was with some friends and we were jogging. We were uh, after school. Mm. And one of them said, well, why don't you do yoga? That would put some muscle on you. And then one of the boys said to me, and then the other boy who was jogging behind said, oh, I've got some books on yoga at home. Mm. So we went back to his place and his father had an antiquarian library in the garret of his house. Mm. And uh, we went up there, and this boy, Chris was his name, pulled these two blue books out of the shelves um, on yogic philosophy. Mm. And it was 14, 14 lessons in yog yogic philosophy and an advanced course in yogic philosophy. Well, I read the books from cover to cover, and there wasn't a single exercise in the book, so I didn't put on any muscle. But I expect you found something else in there. I found this you? nugget. I found the key to the universe. The nugget that I found in that book was a single sentence that said that atoms are but vortices of energy. Right. And what had happened is that the yogis had used their city powers to shrink their consciousness 
into the atom. They'd actually looked into the atom with the inner eye. And they actually saw how energy forms mass. So the Siddhi power is something they, they tapped into through meditation? Through meditation, supersensory powers, yes, mm -hmm. paranormal powers. A bit like my father using you know, the dowsing to locate uranium from a distance. Right. The yogis used their paranormal power, but it was a different type of paranormal power. It was the, it's called the anima Siddhi, the ability to shrink the consciousness into the small, to look into the atom and to look into the smallest particles. They saw the particulate nature of, of, of matter, and they saw the way that energy forms mass, which is the biggest mystery in physics. And this was all in this text? This was all read. in this text, but the, it was the, the key was spin. Okay, so, you're, so they were looking at subatomic particles, mm. they're using their consciousness to penetrate the subatomic particles, and inside these subatomic particles, like electrons and neutrons or No, they were probing the atom. They were probing the atom. Okay. And they saw the electrons and the neutrons and the protons and they saw what they were. Okay, so inside there they saw the vortexes. That's vortices. right, the vortices. They saw it was spinning. They were vortices of light, right. whirlpools of light. Right. And that, did it just ring true to you? Well, what? it r rang true because I knew, I knew enough about nuclear physics. I was then 16. But you realise I had already had a decade of knowledge of physics, of nuclear mm. physics and particle mm. physics through my work with my father. I knew all about Einstein and Rutherford and alpha particles and protons and neutrons. Right. So when I read that sentence, I, I realized that these yogis had anticipated Einstein by thousands of years. That's interesting. So going back to Einstein, who is a bit of a hero of yours, mm. what was, how does Einstein's theory reflect what you, what you saw what you read about in these Vedic texts. Well, I, Einstein realized that matter is a form of energy, that mass is a form of energy. Yeah. But he never knew how energy forms mass. He spoke about matter as being frozen light. Okay, and right. they've, they've just spent eight billion dollars, the equivalent of in euros, on the world's biggest particle accelerator at CERN yes. in Switzerland, primarily to find out how energy forms mass to try to crack this mystery and the yogis cracked it thousands of years ago that's what I realized mm, okay. so I, I, I realized the yogis not only saw that energy that mass is a form of energy e equals mc squared they saw that visually right. but they saw the form of energy in mass and that's the key that's really interesting and so in a way the, the Vedic the Ved sorry, the in ancient Indians could see it with their consciousness. Mm. What Einstein was proving in science. So in a way, you're you're in a way bridging the science gap. and spirituality or religion, mm. Mm. which is which is quite an interesting area. Mm. Now I didn't I didn't actually work. I made the discovery at sixteen. But I was young at the time, and I was more interested in girls and things. Like, you know what I mean? I was Absolutely. just coming in I and, and what have you. Um, but then what happened is I, I went to university. I started university in, in, in um, Belfast, actually. I went across to Belfast. And I had an extraordinary meeting with my professor. Um, I wanted to discuss my future. And I wanted to actually change my course. And, mm. And when I went in into this meeting with Professor, he was the Dean of the Faculty of Science at Queen's University of Belfast. We didn't even talk about my career. Okay. He, he paced the room expressing to me his frustration at students just coming to university and using university as cram shops, you know, mm -hmm. as an extension of school. He said students should be coming to university to break into new ideas, absolutely. to create new theories, to think original thoughts. So he was quite inspired by He you. absolutely galvanized me. I forgot all about career. I mm. From that point onwards, I'm, I'm now 61, I've never had a career, a proper career mm. after that because I, I wasn't going to prostitute knowledge to make money. Mm. I was going to, I just had to develop a new world view, a new yeah. theory for everything.